like we have, if we have increased rates in communities of color, there are, there are exponentially more um, cases of asthma, right? So what they're finding out now is that, that is, that's largely because we don't have enough green space. Right, so there's not enough trees, and there's not enough plants. There's not that's hugely affecting our communities, right? So we have more, we have more um, disproportionately, we have more obesity, right? Disproportionately, we have more high high blood pressure, and um, and, and all these different foodborne illnesses that we have in our communities, and that's because of the foods that we eat. So first and foremost, for our health, that's why community black, that's why garden is important. But I radical act to say that I'm going to take this land that may or may not belong to someone else, right, that belong to me, and I'm going to grow something on that because I can, right? Me and my community, we decided together that this is what we want to do. So when I think about gardening, I think about gardening as a community power because what it does is it brings people together, like the brother Leon said, right? And so much so, we talk about, so I work with a, a, an organization called Soil Generation. It's a, it's a coalition of gardeners and, and garden advocates, I guess, and we help pass, like, do community education and also help with policy in the city. And so one of the things we talk about is how you can utilize your community garden as a strategy to create community power. So there are certain steps you have to take as a community member to create a community garden, right? So you have to you have to engage your neighbors, right? Tell them this is what you want to do. And you also have to, once you get those neighbors together, you have to figure out what's what the skill set in those people in those folks that you have in the room, right? So then once you figure out who has what skills, you bring those skills together and you teach each other, right? So through this process of, of, of organizing yourself to build a garden, you, you learn to organize yourself in any other manner for any other thing you want to happen within your community. Those same steps that you take to build that garden are the same steps you would take to, to rally against a community center or a, a, a large building that may be going, a development that may be happening in your community, right? The same steps that you use to create a community garden will help you and your community to, to do whatever to or fight against or also complete anything else you want to happen in your community. So that's why it's community power. Once you understand that leveraging the skill sets, right, and the people that you have in your community to, to, to come together over something just as small it may seem as a garden, you can use that small thing and then and catapult that to larger things. And the next thing you know, your whole community is empowered to make things happen. And that is why community garden is important. Thank you. Thank you. But there's more to it than that. You want to have security because, you know, the dollar is not going as far in buying food now as it did last year or the year before that. And unless I miss my guess, based on my training, it's going to get a lot more expensive. Uh -huh. Because so far in this country, in the recent past couple of generations, food has been very cheap in relationship to the rest of the world. But when you have just a few companies controlling all the food that you eat, there's a temptation to run that price up. Uh -huh. Because who else are you going to go to to get it? Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so when we talk about our security here, and we also we have a problem with uh, if you're out of work, okay, and you have to make adjustments, you want to have some kind of security, you want to have food security, supply of food that you can tap into the pantry, or if an emergency comes up like major snowstorm or hurricane or something, you want to have something in, the, in as a backup. Now you don't... Okay, so quick, quick and dirty, a man walks into town and says, I'm going to make this a wonderful blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And everybody looks at him and said, we're all poor, we got nothing. What do you mean you're going to build a thing? And he said, oh, I'm going to feed the whole town, that's yeah. what he says. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, well, we're poor, we don't have, we can't have a big party, we have nothing. And he says, well, I got this stone. And I got this stone, and it's a magic stone, and it's going to make the best soup you ever tasted. You go. And, uh, but does somebody have a pot? So somebody says, well, I got a pot, and they bring a pot. And somebody else says, well, I got some water, and they bring some water. And he says, well, it's kind of thin. Anybody got some flour? Anybody got an old soup boat? And it's like, and everybody brings a little. And from each person bringing a little, a beautiful feast. And, the, and he fed the whole town. And it was just because he brought this piece of, soup, uh, piece of stove. And you are that stove within your neighborhood. 
So you're bringing the magic stone, and now you have to use your skills socially or politically or creativity. Creativity. You got to use all of those skills to bring the neighborhood together. Okay. So we've got this lot. We know who owns it. We found out how who owns it. We've gotten permission, or we have not gotten permission. Now we have to have the group, and the group. Transparency is paramount. What does that mean? Don't be sneaking around behind your neighbors. Make sure that the neighbors know because, again, knowledge is power. Everybody's got to know. If, if it means walking around with a petition so that, um, you know, say, are you interested? This is how you're going to find out where your hot spots are. Good hot and bad hot. You're going to have the people that say, oh, you can't have a garden. It's a terrible thing. The kids will destroy it. We'll die from eating the stuff. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't bring animals. It will bring rats. It will draw rats, yes. More than a trash-filled lot, a garden will bring rats. Yeah. So um, you're going to go around and you're going to talk to the neighbors. And that's how you're going to find out who is interested and what are their skills and how their skills can be applied. Um, so you've got your lot. You've got permission or not permission. You've got your group. Now, where are you going to get your supplies? Stone Soup is the major place that you're going to get your supplies. Stone Soup is not a place where you go and they hand you things. But everybody's got a little bit of something. Um, I have a little shameless self-promotion here. I, I teach a class. <laughs> There's a class on Saturday on how to start a community garden. Um, and it's at the Horticultural Society. And what we do is we try to spell out all the eventualities, all the, the possibilities, all the things that you have to know if you want your garden to um, to s survive and thrive and be sustainable. Where are you going to get your seeds? There are lots of places that donate seeds. There are lots of places where you can buy seeds cheap. Where are you going to get your lumber? You can find it. You can find it. You can find it. <laughs> um, mostly people find it. Um, where is your soil? Fairmount Park has amazing stuff, and it is really, really, really dirt cheap. So, also, places you can buy, places you can find. All of the stuff that is necessary to grow a garden is easily accessible. The hardest part is finding the land and making that hard decision of, am I going to get permission, am I not going to get permission? If we did it entirely legally, we would get permission, we would get written permission, we would get written permission for five years from the owner. Because it's hard to put in a garden in one year and then to get some sort of a, a long-term lease. Are there organizations that can work with you to help you do that? Yes, and they're in the room, so we'll talk, they'll talk later. Um, so getting permission, there are LNI requirements for a community garden that sometimes people follow and we can provide those for you. There, um, can you get insurance for your, liability insurance for your garden? That's more difficult, but there are lots of ways to find that. So, um, what is the soil? We talked about where soil comes from, and there's a lot of education about soil that people need to know in order to grow good and healthy gardens. So that, and that information is available within the city. Um, so what am I missing? We got people, we got land, we got plants and supplies, and we got um, we got the rule that you have to party in your garden at least once a year. Nice. So um, rules and regulations are important within the garden, but you decide that as a group. Nobody's gonna. I can give you examples, samples of. Um, of rules and regs that some gardens have adopted. It's important to have rules because you can't expect everybody to know everything and you can't expect everybody to, res to respect your needs unless you have expressed your needs. So um, rules and regs and the rule, my rule, two rules that I always have in any of the gardens that I work with. One is that you um, decide as a group that you will not hold each other responsible. Um, for liability, you are an adult, you will take care of yourself, and we always write that into our rules. And the second thing is that you always have to party at least once a year. And um, if I help you set up your garden, you have to invite me to that party. Now I'm going to turn it over to the next person. And I really, 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 really,
That's great. Thanks so much, Sally. And again. So my name is Amy Laura Kahn. I'm a staff attorney at the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia. Well, we just rebranded. We're just the Public Interest Law Center. Um, I work with Katrina. Um, she is the community organizer, and I'm the staff attorney and director of the Garden Justice Legal Initiative. And what we do is we use law and organizing to support community gardens and market farms uh, in the city of Philadelphia. So a lot of what we do is this question of permission. Um, so Sally just said, what did you say, 70% of gardens? 60% of gardens in Philadelphia are what she called Scott squatter gardens. I tend to say, um, you all are the land stewards. Um, you are the land stewards for Philadelphia, um, along with William, of course. Um, because the, the land is, so much land has been abandoned, and folks have stepped in to take care of it. Um, and I have clients who've been on the same land, had been on the same land for 80 years before they got legal permission. Um, with continuity and programming and funding from the city and doing 4-H um, and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, but it is, has, has historically been very difficult for people to get legal access. So this, this is what we do, is that we help folks get legal access to land. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that and then I'm gonna answer a bunch of questions or send you in the right place to um, get answers to your questions. Um, but I'm gonna talk about it in the context of creating a plan. So I'm not gonna just immediately dig into um, how do you get legal access to land. I, I put it in the context of three questions. First is, um, so it's a who, it's a where, and then it's a what, or how deep. Um, the who is, who are you? How do you define yourself? Um, Sally talked about community, and we talk a lot about community, but community means really different things to different people in different neighborhoods. So when you go out and you're representing yourself as being the community, um, if you're going to the council office, if you're going to the CDC, you have to know what that means. Um, and a lot of you could probably, you know, you'll raise your hand and say, like, like I say, I live in King Sessing or I live in Southwest. Um, but there are other folks who come in and they, they actually don't know. So I always start by saying you really need to know. But it's also a question like, you know, if you're going to start a project on a, on a parcel of land, um, is it for you? Is it for you and your family? Are you doing it on your behalf? Um, are you doing it just because you want to bring food home or share it with the church or share it with the food cupboard? Or are you doing it to, are you an individual that wants to grow food for sale? So you're starting a business. Um, are you a group of neighbors who've come together, so you're an association of people, but you're not incorporated as anything, so you're what, what Pennsylvania calls an unincorporated association? Um, are you a cooperative, which is a different kind of legal entity? So are you, sharing, are you growing food for sale and sharing profits with each other? Uh, are you a nonprofit corporation, like the CDC or many others we know, um, where you've gone to the state and said, I want to be a nonprofit, and then you go to the IRS and you get what we call the, the 501c3 status, which um, are folks familiar with that? So you get it's a tax exempt status, um, but you have to first incorporate with the state, and then you go to the, the feds and say we want to be a nonprofit. Um, or are you a for-profit corporation? Are you a lim limited liability corporation or a partnership or something? So I mean, I, I'm just giving out a list. All of this is everything I'm saying is written down and up at my station so you can get it um, in hard copy. But just to put out the question of when you go and, and ask for permission, on whose behalf? Are you asking because, you know, am I asking because I'm saying me, I, Amy Laura Khan, wants to get a lease? Or am I saying on behalf of this group of people or on behalf of this corporation, et cetera? So think about who are you? And then this question of where is really important. Um, and. I start the question of asking, like, in, what's your neighborhood, what's your community, but then the where, then you have to get really narrow and think about the parcel itself. Uh, and so before we even get to the ownership question, which is a big question, think about zoning. Uh, and do folks know what zoning is? What zoning? Can someone give me a, because I always answer in a legal way, and someone maybe could answer in a more simple way. Yes, do it. I'll take a stab. Thank you. Um, Zoning is the different uses for a specific area in the city or maybe even specific properties. Mm -hmm. So it might be the difference between something that was established for residential use or uh, commercial use or industrial use. 
So those are the big those are the big categories, and there's some a couple other big categories, and and I'm looking at Ash up there from Planning Commission who can talk in way more detail about the zoning. But so residential, commercial, industrial are the big categories. But then even within them, there are specific um, within those those categories there are specific uses. And urban agriculture is a use uh, under our new zoning code as of 2012. So you want to know, do I have permission to do what I want to do? Um, if it's a community garden, most likely you do. Um, but you at least want to ask the question. So community gardens are allowed in most places, in re most residential areas, most commercial areas. Maybe not every industrial area, but you might not want a community garden in every industrial area. Um, but if you want to start growing food for sale, is there anyone who, here who wants to grow food for sale? One person, okay. So, so you're my audience here. Um, so if you want to grow food for sale and that's your purpose, then, you, then you're what's called a market farm under the zoning code. And those are, that's a little bit more restricted. You can still do that in most places, but you still want to find out what the zoning is. So, so when you, once you figure out the where and you've identified the parcel, um, think about you know what are you permitted to do? Do you, do you want to grow food for sale, or do you want to is it just for community use? Most likely you'll be able to do it because this is a pretty permissive zoning code. So the other requirement, which I'm just going to be pretty straight up, most people don't comply with in the city, but I'm just going to tell you what it is: is even if you can do the use, the city planning commission would really like you to register that use if it's a new use. I'm not going to ask. Are you going to say yes? You would like us to register the use? Register the a use registration permit. Oh, yes. Yes. So, <laughs> there, so it is a, and I'll tell you, it's a one-time fee. It's a hundred, so, and this is if you have legal access. But assuming you have legal access, you go to the City Planning Commission. It's an over-the-counter form. It's $125 one-time fee per parcel. Uh, and then the city knows that there's a garden there. And I'll tell you why I think that's important. Um, it helps the city understand the scope of gardening and farming throughout the city, and, and helps establish the case that it's important. It also will let the city know that it's not a vacant lot anymore. And so it's not going to, you know, l and is not going to come and mow it down. Or they're not going to go after the owner and say you have to pay, you have to register it as vacant and pay a fee every year. So you're saving the owner a yearly fee. If you're the owner, you're saving yourself a yearly fee. And I just think you know, I, it's up to you whether you want to pay the hundred twenty-five dollars. But it does, in the longer term, I think it's going to help us out, and I think it'll help individual owners out. Um, so that's really quick and dirty zoning primer. Um, and we've got more information, and Ash is here from PCPC who can answer more questions. Um, there are also, um, if you're growing food for sale, there are specific um, requirements around, um, you, you can have a farm stand on your parcel, but there may be some specific requirements around um, things like fencing, um, composting, stuff like that. Um, and then we get into the who owns the land question, which Sally brought up. And that's a really big question that we get all the time. Um, and I we're, we're stepping into any neighborhood in Philadelphia, maybe not any neighborhood in Philadelphia, but many. People shake their heads and say, it looks, looks like mine. Um, so you've got, my graphics not so good, but you have, you know, you have a house there, you have vacant, vacant, vacant. You've got another house, you might have an apartment building, vacant, vacant. Maybe there's a school here, there's a park at the end, and then there's another vacant lot. And that could be in many neighborhoods, a block uh, in Philadelphia. And so all of these look the same, and you think, oh, they're, you know, they all have the same story, but each, each of them has a very different story. Um, so let's think about if these are all publicly owned, again, you think, oh, they have the same story, you're going to go to the same place, you're just going to go to the city, and you're going to be able to ask for access. And in fact, we now have five different city agencies that you might want to, that you could inquire of. So let's say this one is owned by the Department of Public Property. And I'm going to use the alphabet soup ac acronyms, but I'll tell you what they're, they stand for. So DPP, Department of Public Property, also the city of Phil Philadelphia. This one, PHDC, Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. This one, 
is PRA, um, Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority, and we have folks from, from um, PhDC and PRA today, which I'm very excited about. Um, and then this one is PHA, Philadelphia Housing Authority. So each of these, and then we also have the land bank, which does it own any land right now? No, it doesn't. So it, it's not really in this category yet, but, we're, but it's getting there. Um, but it's important to kind of understand, if you're looking to start asking permission of the city, you have to sort of figure out who, who owns it. Um, and they all have slightly different pathways, and I'm not going to get into each of the pathways to get access. But the bottom line is that um, um, I'm going to name a couple. I have them all written down on sheets. But we have a website called Grounded in Philly that, that helps you understand who owns the land. But there are some other really good resources. Um, the Office of Property Assessment will tell you who owns a lot if you know the address. The Philadelphia Stormwater Map has a visual map, so you can actually click on the, the lot itself, so you know which what lot it is, and then that tells you who owns the lot. Um, your city council person, your CDC, lots of resources to help you figure out the ownership. But there's a there's another resource that's new that's called it's called Philly well it's, it's a couple years old called Philly Landworks, um, and that actually has a map that's just of the city-owned vacant land that's available for sale or lease or license, um, and so that narrows the pool to these, um, and you can just search for the lots that might be available either for sale or lease or license, and it's just public property, PHDC, or PRA. Um, that land work site is, is maintained by the Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority right now, but ultimately will be run by the land bank. And Michael Coots is going to talk to you a, a bit more, in a bit more detail about what the land bank is uh, and how that's going to streamline the process ultimately. Um, PHA is a whole different ball of wax, so if you, if you can choose between lots, it's very difficult to acquire a lot land or get permission to you. So you would more likely want to focus on permission from these. Um, and then there are these lots. They're not public, they're private, but each of them also has a different story. So this person might be deceased. This person might have stayed, stopped paying taxes in 1978. So maybe they're also deceased, or who knows. This is a corporation, an LLC. But the address of the LLC is the same as the vacant lot, so you go and you send them a letter and you say, hey, I'd like to get permission, but it goes right here. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's historically been really difficult to get access. So when Sally talks about asking for permission, I mean, one of the things you can start with is you go to the Office of Property Assessment or you go to the um, website or you go to the Department of Records and, and actually get the person's name and address and send them a letter and say, hey, I'd like to get permission to use this lot. It's always a good starting point. And if you have success, you can, you know, you can get permission. It's, no one's paid taxes on it since 1978. One thing you can do is try to get it listed for share sale. You can put down an $800 deposit. It has to go through a whole judicial process um, because the person who owns it needs an opportunity to come back and pay taxes, take it back, etc. But if you get it listed for share sale, you can, you can bid on it and you might be able to acquire it. Um, it's always a risk because you're bidding against whoever else wants to bid on it. Um, but it is certainly an option and sometimes it takes a long time. Um, and sometimes you can't get the city or the city's collection agencies to bring it to sheriff sale for, for whatever reason. Um, but once you buy it from sheriff sale, that clears any sort of debt, whether it's the tax debt or other liens, uh, and you get it free and clear, and so it's yours. Um, with the person who is deceased, were you to have a lawyer and, and have some assistance, you might be able to raise their estate and actually um, I, have, I know that some CDCs have been uh, effective um, in working to find heirs and things like that, particularly for really dilapidated properties, like houses that are causing danger to other houses, um, and finding, you know, finding heirs and getting it to sale. So that is an option. It's a little more, certainly a little more expensive. Um, there's a law under the state, state law called a conservatorship, um, and for land that is considered either blighted or abandoned under that law, you can go to the court and ask to become the conservator. So you become, basically you get legal access to come in and rehabilitate that lot. The goal of the law is, as it's written, is, is so that you would ultimately sell it because then you can pay your, the taxes back 
and pay back yourself for all the work you put in. Um, but you can there the law doesn't um, preclude you from keeping the lot for yourself. It also just doesn't it doesn't clear the tax debt, and so that's the risk with conservatorship, is that you know you may get legal access and ultimately own the lot, but then you'd have to pay the back taxes. Um, similarly, is, has anyone been on a, the same lot for 21 years? We, we, so you've been on the same lot for 21 years. There, so there is a such thing as squatters' rights. It's called adverse possession um, under Pennsylvania law. If you've been on the same lot and you can meet five requirements, things like you're doing it openly and notoriously, you're doing it. You don't have permission. You're doing it hostily to the owner. You can go to court and say, you know. I actually have title, equitable, what's called equitable title to this land. I really own this land because I've been here for the long term. I've been here for 21 years and it's mine. And some, very occasionally that works. But the issue with that again is that you take on the taxes. So if nobody's paid the taxes since 1978, you may take on a on significant debt. Um, and then finally, and what we are really hoping is a big solution for us but it's, you know, get moving slowly, um, working out the kinks, is that the land bank should actually be ultimately being able to do to intervene at sheriff sale and, and take properties and rather than put them up for the highest bid, be much more intentional about making them available for community uses, for economic development, for affordable and accessible housing, uh, for open space and urban agriculture. And so the land bank has a really what I think is a fairly beautiful document, which is its strategic plan, that says how it's going to do that. Um, if the land bank intervenes at share of sale, that can clear the debt too. And so there's there could be a more um, a better negotiation for, for discounted price or even a nominal price uh, that makes it much more affordable for communities and community groups that are that are wanting to do this. Where and then what are your goals? Um, so are you doing this for the short term or are you doing this for the long term? We think about this so kind of on a spectrum that goes from the point at which you're, you're not asking permission at all because man, maybe you're going to be there for a little bit or maybe not. Uh, and you're, not, you're investing stone soup investment but not necessarily putting down deep roots. So, so that's kind of the starting point. The next point at which, you know, is, is where you just get access. So you get legal access and you might get what's called a license. The city calls them an urban garden agreement, and they're usually one year. The thing with the U, it, we call it a UGA, the UGA is that they are actually revocable at any time, and so it really is just permission to be on a piece of land. So again, if you're not necessarily thinking about a long-term goal, it's a good solution to get short-term access. It might be, you know, for a lot that you ultimately, as a neighborhood, want to be developed as housing, but for you know the next year or a couple of years, you want something to happen on it so it's clean and green and people get to use it. So that's a license is a good option for that. And then you start to think about, okay, well, what are my longer term goals? Do I want to be here for a little bit? And that's when you, you might want to ask for a lease. And the city under the current policies allows for up to five year leases. There haven't been that many of them, um, but it is an option. But with a lease of longer, and with a lease, you can't be asked to leave without any cause. So you, it's not revocable at any time, it's for that term, term of years. It's like if you're renting an apartment. Um, so if you get it for five years, it's for five years unless you violate the contract. Um, so it's something certainly worth asking. It does require the permission of the council person. Um, and if you're gonna get a lease from the city, you would have to have liability insurance because the city worries, it worries about its own liability. And then finally, and if you're thinking about the long-term preservation, and we're always thinking about long-term preservation, particularly with gardens that have been there for 25, 30 years, um, there's a couple of options. You know, one of them, it, it come back, comes back to this question of the who. I mean, if you're an individual, you might want to buy that yourself and become the owner. Uh, and maybe you're the best long-term person for that land. Um, that may, that's the best solution often if you own the house next door and you want to purchase that as a side lot. Um, often, if it's a city-owned property, that's an option. Um, if it's if it's adjacent to your home where you live, um, but other options might be to we have someone here from the Neighborhood Gardens Trust, which is a land trust, um, and Jenny Greenberg, she's there, but she'll be at that table with me. Um, the the land trust preserves gardens 
in perpetuity, so forever. Uh, it has about 35 gardens in its inventory right now, um, and is looking over the next couple of years to really um, build that list and preserve garden, a lot of gardens around the city. So if you have a garden that's been there for a long time, or even in like longer than four or five years, that it would be good to connect with NGT. Um, and also, we have Parks and Rec here, um, we have Elisa Rusa Spazio, and um, Elisa runs the Farm Philly program. And Farm Philly, in, in certain instances, will also um, work with you so that parks can preserve land for gardening. Um, or, or you can just start to garden on a park, work with the Parks and, parks and Rec, and, and really digging in on publicly owned land is maybe an option to be somewhere in the long term. Uh, so it's essentially the first job or the, the first priority of the Philadelphia Land Bank is to acquire all of the surplus vacant property that the agencies don't uh, either have expressions of interest for or have potential reuses for and uh, to combine them in the land bank. Uh, the second piece is uh, and Amy referenced this is to acquire properties. Currently, there are eighty or ninety thousand dollars, eighty or ninety thousand tax delinquent vacant properties in the city of Philadelphia that could be acquired. Um, most of them are vacant land, and most of them could be repurposed into gardens, uh, lots for single-family homes, uh, some commercial. Uh, yeah, pretty much uh, mixed-use properties if it's a corner lot in most neighborhoods. And the hope is that once we get the approvals from the city to begin that process, we'll be able to go into a sheriff's sale, for example, hand them a list of properties that we'd like to acquire. Uh, they, uh, and the mechanics had not worked out, so I'm sort of making some of this up, but they will uh, circulate the list, and those properties will come off the sheriff sale list. They won't be bid. They won't be. They won't accept bids for those properties that day, and they will immediately be owned by the Philadelphia Land Bank, and be available for disposition to the public. So those are the two key functions of the Philadelphia Land Bank. Uh, we're also taking more. More and more, we're looking at. Uh, maintaining the inventories regardless of which agency owns them. So we're, we're putting more money this year into uh, maintaining city PhDC lots and uh, I think PRA is still maintaining their lots and they do a pretty good job of it. They have their own maintenance department. Horticultural Society. My name is William Leiter. Uh, I've been with this uh, organization and program since uh, the spring of 2011. Uh, the program is a city-funded program. We are partners with the City of Philadelphia. Pennsylvania Horticultural Society simply manages the program. So I am in that team that manages uh, this work. Uh, the program is 14 years old, it went citywide and supported by the city in 2002. Uh, and we do our work twice a year. Um, let me back up to describe the work. Everybody's familiar with a vacant lot. Maybe on your block next door, around the corner, whatever. Okay, so we have a clean and green program that we refer to as Philadelphia Land Care. Uh, the Clean and Green program has two components. There is a professional contracted component, which is Philadelphia oh, Landcare, and then you have the community component, which is where uh, the local CDCs and other nonprofit organizations come in. And they have staff that is paid to maintain the parcels that are significant to their neighborhood. Okay? So we have these two components to the program. Together, they're under the Philadelphia Land Care umbrella. And uh, we stabilize our lots. We bring new lots into the program twice a year, in the fall and in the spring. 
and that work is done by professional landscape contractors. Okay, uh, I am part of the team that identifies the target areas around the city. Uh, I'm part of the team that goes out and select the sites. I'm part of the team that, um, our team is really small, all right, so I get a, a lot of the work. Um, we also go out and survey and measure the sites, making notes of the existing conditions, and then designing the sites, how the new fences and the trees should be installed, all right? And then after that work happens, the next spring, those sites go into our automatic maintenance program, okay? And that is done by either our local um, neighborhood or organizations or our professional contractors, all right? And then I manage those contractors as well, all right? Different mentality. It seems hard. It seems challenging. I don't say hard because only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. So, so I'm ready. I'm ready for this challenge. And I was built. I was built for this. I think that we all have we all have a purpose in life. And mine and mine is going to take on a task that most that most of back away from, from. Impossible. that impossible, people say, people it's, say impossible. it's impossible, I see possibilities, I don't see anything, I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible, mentality, mentality. There, are there are different mentalities, but just like, just there's, like different there's different ways to teach people how to read, there's different, there's different ways to communicate people, it's different ways, it's different ways to communicate people and their different mentalities, so I do so see, I do hope. see hope. I and hope, and that's all coming together, together and understanding each other, and learning to respect.